Today our guest is Ifi Anamano, a professional soccer player for Gotham FC and a member of the Nigerian national team. In this episode, we unpack some of the lessons Ifi has learned surrounding injury and self-confidence in sport. Ifi shares some of the challenges of being a black athlete in a predominantly white sport in the U.S. and emphasizes the importance of role models. Ifi is a Viz League mentor on the Voice and Sport platform and is a key driver behind our partnership with the Black Women's Player Collective to bring more visibility to incredible role models like herself in the sport of soccer. As a board member on the BWPC, Ifi uses her voice to drive change and progress for the sport. In this episode, she discusses the barriers in soccer that led to an exclusive environment in the sports industry. She also highlights the work she is doing with the other Black Women Player Collective members to increase exposure in soccer in Black communities and explains her path to becoming an advocate. Ifi, welcome to the Voice in Sport podcast. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> I love yeah. it. You're part of the Viz advocacy team. You're also a board member of the Black Women's Player Collective and you are an NWSL professional soccer player. So it's gonna be a great conversation today, learning about your journey, not just on the field, but also off the field and how you've advocated for change. So I'm, I'm so excited to kind of get into some of these conversations that you and I have been having off of live podcasting. So let's start though with your background. You know, where did it all really start for you? I mean, you have in today's season, in the 2021 season, you're one of the top goal scorers in the league, which is pretty incredible with seven goals. So where did it all start? Did you always know you were going to be a soccer player, pro soccer player, or did you have other sports growing Yeah, I think... Growing up, I started with playing soccer. I think at that time, it was sort of the sport to play in the in the early 2000s. So yeah, I think I have three brothers. So I'm from California. I have three brothers. We all were kind of put into soccer at the same time. At, at the, When I was, uh, I think I was seven years old, <laughs> my dad had decided not to put me on this team because he didn't like what they practiced. So I ended up waiting to like the spring and with my younger brother, who's like only like 11 months younger than me, like we're like Irish twins, which is like a fun fact I like to mention sometimes. We were put on the same team and we played together that spring and it was just kind of noticeable. I think that I was pretty good. Like I had a mild understanding of of the game at a young age and I was better than my brother. I'll tell you that. And from there, I kind of just progressed. So like at 10, I sort of joined a more serious team. So it was like the teams you sign up for and then like the select teams. And so I got put on the select team. And then from there, I was kind of doing tournaments and, you know, I joined a club. I was playing for Arsenal when I was younger. And, you know, we were traveling to different states to play. That's kind of where, like, we did ECNL and that kind of started, you know, the the move where it seemed like soccer could get me a scholarship to school. So then, like, now my parents were incredibly on board with the whole thing. So then I, you know, continued that from being in club from high school. I went to Cal. And I think, you know, it was twofold. You know, not only was like the soccer something I wanted to pursue in college, but also my education because I was interested in math and sciences. And so Cal being a school that was had a very long history of just the the brilliance in the sciences definitely persuaded, you know, my, you know, swayed me to go there. So really enjoyed my education there. And I'll say that It wasn't always a thing to become a professional athlete. That definitely came later. But yeah, it's almost, I like just, because I I still enjoyed the sport, it would have been a shame to stop. So I think that's kind of where I continued and like, here I am. (laughs) So do you remember like those early years, like why you, why you were playing and has that changed today when you think about why you're playing professionally? Definitely. I think when I was younger, it was an escape and it was fun. So like, although I enjoyed school, I also liked to just pee outside and run. And it was a way I could hang out with my friends and it was a way to travel. So I think for me, it was just the mode of where I sort of had fun. It was just just blatant fun. There was no thought to it for me. There was no stress because there was nothing to sort of like stress about. Like, although I was garnering, you know, accomplishments at a young age, it wasn't about that. I was just about hanging out with my friends. And, you know, as I got older, obviously, like now that I play professional or even in college, 
it became a little bit more serious. So in order to, you know, when you when you reach a certain part of your career, like college or professional, your performance actually matters. And that's that's how you continue to play. So you have to play well in order to continue to do this. So yeah, I think the meaning did change after a while. It became a, a lot more serious and, you know, now it's my job. So obviously that, there's so much more tied to it. It's like my career. So yeah, I mean, I still find it fun, but obviously there's a different element to it as opposed to when I was, I was younger. Well, we know one of the reasons why we built the voice and sport platform and community is because girls fall out of sport around that age of like 13 and 14. And then there's another big dip in high school. And it sounds like you didn't really have that, that issue of like feeling stressed or wanting to wanting to stop. But a, a lot of young girls do drop out and they stop at that age group. What would you say to a, a young girl today that might be like faced with either the stress of sport or just maybe not really feeling like it's fun anymore, but you want to inspire her to like stay in the game. What would your advice be to her? I would say that's difficult because I think growing, I think now there's so much more pressure with social media. And I know that as a young woman, as a young girl, sports is sort of not a realm in which, you know, for whatever reason is seen as something that, you know, a girl or a woman should be doing for some reason. And I think social media kind of amplifies that message, unfortunately. I would say like, do what makes you happy. I think at the end of the day, I think you learn this (laughs) as you get older that it, it, it matters a little bit less what, you know, people think about you. I think at the end of the day, it only matters about how you feel about yourself. And I think if your sport makes you happy, and I think sport is incredibly important too. It keeps you active. You know what I mean? I think even that aspect, you know, do what makes you happy. And if you want to continue to play, nothing and no matter what anyone says should stop you from doing that. Oh, I love it. I think that's so important. You know, it's hard though. I think there, there's, I think parents can sometimes be part of the problem, you know, if they put so much pressure on their kids Absolutely. to perform or to get to a scholarship, especially if you're part of some of these more elite leagues, like the youth leagues that are very elite, they're expensive to get in. You know, if a girl is feeling like she has pressure, how do you like delineate mm-hmm. the difference between like, I'm feeling so much pressure. It's like making me not want to love what I actually do love. Like I actually love the sport, Absolutely. but how do you like separate those two feelings? You know, do you remember back, like maybe that happening to you as you were considering whether or not to go to college? Definitely. I think, you know, for me, I, I, I was lucky in some way because I think my parents never, I think, envisioned me to become a professional athlete. They never envisioned soccer to be lasting this long. They definitely didn't push me, so to speak, but they didn't stop me from doing it at the same time. It was always about school. Like as long as I did well in school, nothing else really mattered. Like I could do what I want. Like if that kind of changed, like if I wasn't performing well in school, then, you know, soccer was kind of off the table for me. Apparently, like that's what I was told. Like you got to do well and or like soccer was supposed to be like your school was the priority and then soccer came second. And now I see there's a trend of, you know, a lot of elite youth teams coming up very very expensive especially soccer in you know this country is a pay-to-play model you got to pay in order to play and parents are shelling out loads of money to get their girls in this and so you know I can see where that that idea of it becomes pressure because then your parents are like you know I spent all this money to get you the training that you need and you don't want to play anymore or like you've wasted this it's almost a feeling like you've wasted all this time or you wasted all this money. So that can be very, very difficult. I think Um, the biggest thing I would say is that I wouldn't want anyone to feel pressure to play a sport. You know what I mean? I think as long as it stayed fun for me, you should continue to play no matter what, you know, sort of this perceived sense of waste is. And Honestly, I think that if you do not want to play anymore, you shouldn't have to. And it's okay to take a break. I know for me, when I was in high school, I think 15, I tore my ACL. And that was hard, but it wasn't, I wasn't too 
uh, sad about it. So then I didn't, in high school soccer, I didn't play my freshman year. And then my sophomore year, I was back and I played soccer. I played high school soccer and honestly, I didn't enjoy it. And so I was like, I'm just going to take a break. So I took a break my junior year and I said, I'm just going to do track and I'm just not going to play high school soccer because at that time you couldn't do club in high school at the same time. So when club stopped, I was like, I'm just going to stop for a little bit because I'm just not enjoying it right now. And after my junior year, obviously came my senior year and I came to think like, oh, I want to do soccer. I came to a point where I had to not necessarily choose, but I couldn't necessarily get away with not playing soccer for, you know, four months. So I was like, you know, if I want to play soccer in college, I'm going to have to like play high school soccer. And I think that break really allowed me just to figure out like what I truly loved to do. So I'd say if anyone's ever struggling with sort of, do I even love this anymore? Take a break. You are young and you have time. I love it. It's such a strong message. Like, it's okay to take a break and you'll find that joy again, like when it's right for you. And I think that's like, it's inspiring to see because like now here you are like one of the leading gold scorers in like the league. (laughs) And you took a break in high school when most girls, a lot of girls are stressing out about whether or not they're going to get a scholarship. So, you know, also like you can try another sport. There's so many amazing athletes too that like start in one sport, go to another sport in college. So I think just that's really great to hear. I want to talk a little bit about the system. You know, you mentioned like one barrier to entry into the soccer world is a cost. And because of that cost, you know, it really prohibits a lot of young girls and boys to play the sport in the U.S. past really that recreational age group. And so unfortunately, sort of that system then just folds into sort of this non-inclusive environment across the sports industry. And I want to talk about what was that experience like for you? Because as you now get to the league that you're at now, and even Division One soccer that you were playing in college, there's about 7% of the female athletes that are Black in both Division One and in the league. So how do how do we fundamentally, I guess, make it a more inclusive environment so that we see more young Black girls continue their journey in soccer? I think, you know, you know, part of it is just definitely like the, the, the play to pay model is definitely a big aspect of it. I think for me, my one, one thing is that I think I am lucky because my parents did have the resources to provide for me. But I do understand that that is not the reality of a lot of people. And because that's not a reality, I think for the most part, soccer is not marketed in the black community at all because it's so ex- it's so expensive to play here if you want to play it at a high level it is expensive so it's not it's not marketed there and i think you know because it's not marketed there then a lot of girls a lot of black women or you know women of color do not even know you know how much this sport can bring because in fact i think there are more d1 scholarships for women in soccer than there are for boys which a lot of people I don't think know, because I know at Cal at the time, I think there were 14 full scholarships for girls. And I think there were five, between five and nine for the men. And that's because partially that men forego college as a, and just go straight to, you know, the league. But in saying that, I think it's exposure, then there's lack of exposure in the Black community, because obviously, if you can't afford it, there's no point of advertising it to you. (laughs) <laughs> at the same time, which is a mm-hmm. shame. But so, and then I think that is kind of, I, I think we're going to talk about a little bit more later, but, you know, my work with the BWPC is just bringing that exposure to, you know, under undervalued communities to see like, hey, look at this sport. And then on top of that, providing a, a space in where they can dabble with the sport and hopefully want to know more about the sport and in the future provide, you know, scholarships of our own to provide to, you know, young women who want to continue to play past, you know, the youth age. Yeah. I love that. I love what you guys are doing there and trying to like really create an accessible point of entry to the sport in those communities with the mini pitches and all the work you guys are doing. I think it's incredible. And I love the partnership we have with you guys with the Black Women's Players Collective because that Mm -hmm. allows you to have access and the young girls to have access to role models who look like them 
And that's why I'm so proud about like you're a Viz League men mentor on the platform and having that access to role models is just so powerful for young girls in sport, especially Definitely. in sports where it's predominantly white. So I want to talk a little bit about like, who was your role model growing up and what does it mean now to you to mentor young girls in sport and be their role model? Yeah, I think even to your point, I think there was for a long time a lack of, you know, role models, black role models in soccer. So I think that partially attributed to the fact where I didn't know I was going to play professionally because quite frankly, there was, it didn't seem like a viable option for me. And so growing up, I think weirdly, I looked to the, <laughs> to the men to be and my, my role models. I still like watched like Ronaldo. I watched Messi, you know, Kobe Jones on LA Galaxy. I used to go love going to LA Galaxy games. Like those were kind of the people I looked to in terms of like my game in soccer. And, you know, part of me is a little jealous of the girls today because they have, you know, black women and different women to look up to in soccer, as opposed to, I feel like I didn't really have anyone. It's funny. I think we did this with uh, some of the girls we worked for with in the mini pitch, asked them who their favorite player was. And someone were like, Crystal Dunn or like Glenn Williams, you know what I mean? Like even Alex Morgan, like. I didn't have that to say. Like, I was like, then they asked, like, who was your role model? I'm like, Ronaldo. I like, feel silly <laughs> saying that. But I'm so happy that they're actually seeing, you know what I mean, women in sport and being like, those are my role models, as opposed to, you know, the little representation that existed when I was growing up. Yeah, it's so amazing to see for our daughters, too, then the next generation mm -hmm. that they get to see amazing women like you see you guys on TV a bit more now. And I know we're making progress there, yes. which is great. But also just, you know, there there is more focus on investing in the sport, in, investing in women's sports, which is really incredible to see. So I want to talk a little bit about your transition into college. You know, a lot of the girls as part of our community are wondering, okay, how do I best get ready for college? Mm -hmm. And that transition from yeah. playing high school, even if it's a high school elite team, you know, going from that to a whole new, t whole new crew, you went to the University of California, Berkeley, Cal. And so you stayed in the same state, but it was a different environment for you. So can you talk about what you went through in that transition and just be super raw about like, what was the hardest part? And like, what was something that was like, you were really excited about? Mm -hmm. I think I was excited about <laughs> like freedom. <laughs> I think it's like you go to college, you're like, I'm free. But at the same time, it's scary. I remember my first week there, I had to do something with like my medical insurance. And I was like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Like I had to go to like the medical clinic and I had to do this <laughs> because like I had, it was like for soccer. And one of the juniors like told me where it is. And in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, she's going to go take me down to where I need to go do all this stuff. Not knowing that like, hey, you have to go by yourself. Like, welcome. <laughs> like, welcome to college. Like, you have to take care of yourself. So that was like. Welcome to independence. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm like silly little me not thinking that like someone was going to take care of me. But like. I think that was the biggest thing is that you have to like realize like, okay, now you have to like take care of yourself a little bit more than you did when you're at home and your parents did everything for you. And they made sure your cleats were in your bag and they made sure that you you had everything you needed and you had money in your pocket. Like that was like the basic, biggest change for me. And just the, the shifts in your thinking, I think was a big thing for me, like outside of soccer, some of the great experiences that I had in college and then some of the like outside the classroom, outside of soccer, just meeting and talking to people. You just learn so much more than you do in a classroom, I think. So in terms of soccer, I don't know if I'm just weird, but I didn't have too big of a like shift, like, oh, I have to do this. I didn't really think about that. You know, I think it was my freshman year. I think that naivety kind of attributed to my success in a weird way because I didn't think too much of it. I just thought to myself, well, they want me here, so I'm just going to do what I did before. Like, I'm not going to change anything. I think it wasn't until my sophomore years where things kind of changed for me. I kind of had a slump then where it was like things that I was doing before on the field weren't working. And it was really eye-opening to me that, you know, 
more work had to be done. And I kind of just enlisted help in terms of like my coaches and just like outside help or, you know, my coach from club and just asked him for honest feedback and honest opinion. I think that's all you can really do is get honest feedback, honest opinion, and like work towards whatever goal you do set for yourself. Oh, I love that you went back to your old coach in high school and said like, hey, can you just like break it down for me now? Like, because maybe yeah. you'd be maybe slightly different years, right? Slightly different willingness exactly. to listen. That's super interesting. I should have done that. Well, you and I have something in common too. We both got injured in college in sports. And so I want to talk about how you dealt with that because, you know, injury can be tough, but especially when you like, you feel like you've worked so hard to get to that level of college division one, and then you get injured. So Tell us about the injury that you faced and and what would be your tips to overcoming a big injury when you feel like you just got to like arriving? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, like I said, my freshman year success, sophomore year, just a mess, I would say. And then my junior year, I was coming in pretty confident. I was like, you know, after that, that year, it, it changed things for me. And I went back to the drawing board and I just trained like hell and I was like, I'm going to come back better than ever. This is going to be my year. Like last game of preseason, worst injury I've ever had. So I was in the box and I was dribbling on my left foot and I'm a righty. So I'm a little awkward on my left and a player comes from behind. And I think she like almost comes like on top of me. So like pushing me in the back. And my, my leg was on the ball in a weird way. And so it kind of, not to be too like graphic, but twist my leg in an awkward position. And I, I tear my IT band, my hamstring, my LCL just off the bone. So it kind of like, so whatever connects like my thigh to my leg, it just comes up. And then on top of that, I tore my ACL. So that just kind of came with it. So basically the only thing holding my leg together is my MCL if you know knee anatomy. So that's oh yes. Like all Unfortunately, that's I have torn my ACL, but that's like one. You just tore like three. Yeah, three I tore a lot of things. So I think after initially I'd done, like at that time I was pretty, so I, I did integrative biology in college. So I knew my anatomy a little bit. I knew my anatomy well enough. And right after it happened, everyone's coming to me and saying, you're, you're okay. Like, it's probably just a bone bruise. I was like, I'll tell you, it's not a bone bruise. <laughs> when I got that diagnosis, it was probably one of the hardest things I've ever heard or the hardest things I knew I was going to have to go through. Um, my trainer and my coach came to my, my house and I had my teammates with me that I live with. And when my coach came, I was a little nervous because I'm like, he's going to tell me I can never play again because why would he come to tell me the diagnosis? And immediately when they entered the room, I started bawling crying because I'm thinking he's going to tell me like we'll do everything we can for you like you can still stay on the team you know but this is like the end I literally thought I was gonna be the conversation but luckily like I think he was just there for support he was just there to offer extra support along with my some of my teammates that I had lived with at the time I was just being really dramatic in my head maybe I don't know but yeah I think you know I had an excellent amazing trainer at the time and an excellent amazing surgeon too but yeah, I think at the time, because I couldn't reasonably play, I think I was on crutches for eight weeks. It was a pretty long recovery. I think it was like, obviously I was out for the rest of the season. Plus on top of that, I think it was like nine months I was out for. And so it was a long time. And in that moment, I definitely had to redirect my focus a little bit because it, it was hard. I couldn't do, I think I was in chemistry. I was in a chemistry lab at the time and... <laughs> I was on crutches and I can't carry the beakers around and chemicals and I'll, and it's slippery. And I'm like, I can't be in this class. So I had to like change my classes around like things like that. Like just like those little things that like, started to like really get to me. And, you know, I was like, well, I mean, you can only go up from here. So, you know, it was just focusing on school at that point and then my recovery. So, you know, it was just, trying to be diligent about, you know, everything I could possibly do to get back stronger than where I was before. And that meant, you know, coming to my rehab on time and taking that seriously. I just had a really good support system around me to get me through that. And, you know, I did summer school, which I don't know why I just really enjoyed 
being at campus and continued my rehab even after the semester ended. And my trainer was alongside me doing all this stuff. And I was able to come back my senior year and, you know, play like nothing, nothing ever happened. Well, it's a, it's a big, (laughs) it's a big injury. And especially to do it like, you know, in such a dramatic way, Mm -hmm. the fact that you came back from that is pretty incredible. And it sounds like you had a pretty good mindset going, going even through the recovery, but it can be sometimes hard Mm -hmm. to like, let your body heal especially on those longer injuries and so important to do that. But it also gives you this time to like perfect other parts of your game. Did you work on like the mental side of your game at all or work with the sports psychologist during that time? We didn't really have access to a sports psychologist, but I wish we did. I think that would have been really helpful. I think for me, I'm able to self-regulate, but I know that's not the, it's not necessarily the reality of every athlete or every person and I think you know therapy and psychology all that is incredibly important especially in the realm of sports and it's unfortunate that I didn't have access to that because that would have probably saved me a lot of crying (laughs) that I did because it gets frustrating when my first rehab session I couldn't lift five pounds with my leg you know what I mean that is frustrating and you have to be like you know luckily in a way I had gone through an injury my freshman year in high school, so I knew that it's all going to come back, you know, but if it's your first injury, you're not so sure. You're you're really not so sure. So yeah, it's just kind of whether it be reading books, which I wasn't really into at that time, but reading books, getting insight from other athletes who have been through injuries. I had a teammate who had gone through like three ACLs, which was helpful, and she actually started taking me to yoga. So like, she just was like, we're going to yoga. It's really good for you. I think you're really going to like it. And she was right. I did. And I did yoga with her for the time she was there. And I think that really, really helped me a lot was just that like meditation practice and just like the calming of my mind. That's one of the biggest things that I'm so thankful for, because when I was injured in high school, ACL injury, I started doing yoga and Mm -hmm. it's now stuck with me my whole life. And so it's one of those amazing practices to bring into your game before you're injured. But sometimes it it takes an injury to bring in some of those things. But actually, the reason why some athletes can come out so much more ahead after an injury is because they start paying more attention to those things that they may they weren't paying attention to before that mind body connection, the mental health part of sport. So yeah, it's really cool that 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 has you're fully embracing in that now. And obviously, it's working. So at what point, (laughs) you know, at what point in I guess, in your career in college, did you discuss or start thinking about going pro? At that point, you know, Mm -hmm. you come back to your senior year, did you always know you wanted to go pro? Did you think you'd be successful? And then tell us a little bit about that transition to pro life. So like my super senior year, I was like, this game has gotten too easy is what my thought was. Like there was a point where I was not too easy in a way, but just like, I wanted more. I wanted to be challenged more. And that's when for me, I was just like, I think I want to play professionally. I was like on the field. I can score, not, not every team, but I was like, I can score when I want to, I can choose to play today and, you know, really show up today. Or I can choose to just like, kind of take the day off and like take it easy for this game and I'm like that's such a shame like (laughs) that's such a shame like I want to feel that like I I need to compete I want to compete still and that was like I so I want more I think I do want to go professionally and so I didn't really know what that meant I didn't know if I was gonna go overseas or anything because not everyone gets drafted but I did enter the draft and luckily I did get drafted if I hadn't I can't say what would have happened to be honest but yeah I think it was just that shift of like oh I want more is why I went professional and then I think because I got drafted and I entered a very competitive league I thought to myself okay well you know I've arrived I had all this expectation of the things I was going to do in the league I thought I was going to play my first year and stuff like that and like lo and behold you know I'm sitting on the bench every single game so it was very (laughs) it did not feel great because in my mind (laughs) I'm the best player there is but at the same time the coach (laughs) is thinking something completely different and I can't 
control the way or what he thinks of me. Unfortunately, I can't control my playing time. And I think that's one thing that was a shift for me because like obviously in college, I was this player, like I was playing a lot. I was starting every single game and then to professional and I'm not even looked at really. I'm not looked at as that that go-to player. And it was weird. It didn't feel good and it made me second guess my own ability unfortunately. I'm sure that happens with a lot of transitions, not just high school to college, but college to pro, like you're describing. So did you ever, you know, in that moment, think about quitting? And then, you know, Um, what kept you going? So after my rookie season, the team I was on, Boston, folded, fortunately. And I laugh about it now. At the time, I didn't find it as funny. So that team folded. So we had to do like a dispersal draft. And I know like for some reason, I was so stressed out because ultimately I hadn't played my rookie season. So I'm like, what if a team doesn't pick me up because they haven't seen me in like a year? No one's seen me play in a year. All, all, All the film I have is from college. Like, but you can't get go based on college anymore. Like I have no sort of, you know, resume in the league. So like, who's going to take me sort of thing. So after I got taken by Portland, I cried because I was like, oh my God, I think I'm going to get a second chance. You know, like, I think I'm going to get a second chance and it felt really good. And I don't know, I just felt like there was like, kind of just like a release of anxiety, but at the same time, like, lo and behold, I didn't know that I was in for a whole nother journey. (laughs) <laughs> coming up and so like the second year I was you know not playing and there was a point where I was not even on the travel roster I was not getting rostered and then my third year I I talked about this recently which I haven't like I haven't told a lot of people but I think there was a moment so at this time I'm reading a lot of like self-help books you know not even sports specific ones oh. they're just like regular self-help books so I started reading you are a badass I had finished that book and I think that was my third year in the league and one morning so this is after I'm not traveling I'm you know not on the roster like I'm not being rostered for games and I'm like I don't know what's going on anymore I'm starting to get scared because ultimately in this league you know our contracts are semi-guaranteed So if you're not getting roster, you're not playing games, there's a point where you could just be out of here. And I woke up one morning and I said, I'm going to go on a walk. We had an inner squad. And I said, I'm just going to go on a walk to clear my head because I was like incredibly nervous for this inner squad for some reason. It's during like preseason. And I go, just think, I'm just thinking to myself, like, what do I want? What do I want? You know, do I still want to play? Like, who do you think you are? Like, would have like what basically trying to separate what have I been told about myself and what do I actually believe about myself and I kind of just went through like a a mental list of like okay this is what I sort of think this is what I've been told recently about myself you know you need to do this whether it be like oh you're not you're not shooting enough or you know you're not good in this space you're not good in the ball you need to work on your first touch you're not this you're not that you're you're not good at this And then what I actually believed in myself or believed about myself or what I thought was special about my game. And I said, do you actually want to stop playing or is it because you're starting to believe what people are saying about you? And I said, I think I'm just starting to believe what people are starting to think about me. And so like, am I good enough? And I'm like, do you think you're good enough? It's all talking in my head. I'm like, I honestly do still think I'm good enough. I just don't think I've been given a chance. And I said, okay, well, now you're going into this inner squad game. Like, what do you want to do? And I said, I just want to prove to myself that I am good enough. And no matter what that means, like, ultimately, I didn't think anymore that Portland was where I was supposed to be. It came to a point where before anything happened, I was like, I don't think this is a place where I'm going to succeed. I don't think I'm giving, being given enough chances to prove how good I am. And so after that inner squad game, I, I played really well. I did. I played. I can say to, about myself, I played really well. And then it was told to me, like, I thought, oh, maybe I, m- I might travel this uh, weekend because I think I played so well. Comes up to me and he says, you might think you played really well I and mean, other people might tell you that you deserve to travel, but no one did anything bad enough to warrant them getting off the travel team. Not that I did anything 
not that it was all, so you, at this point, like that for me solidified that it, it was nothing I could do anymore. It wasn't about me. It wasn't about me. So it was nothing I could do in that space. And that was fine. The thing is like, after all that, I guess, work, mental work I had done, I think it set me up for this moment where I was like, okay, well, quite frankly, it's not about me because I did everything I could do. I think I did. I did myself justice. You know, I was happy and I was proud of myself. And then the next morning I was waved and I was <laughs> at the same time as though I was upset, you know, had this been me two years ago, I would have been in my room crying, not knowing what to do, packing my stuff to go home. Um, but instead, I was like, well, I need somewhere to go. I need somewhere to play. I need somewhere to prove. Like, I, he wasn't, I don't think he was trading me adequately. I was like, um, just trying, trying to trade me, but who the hell, who knows what that even means? Didn't find anyone there. So I got put on like the discovery list and I called one of like, I called someone I knew on another team and I said, do you guys have room? Like, do you think if I came here, that I could potentially get a contract. And they were like, yes, gave me the number to their GM, was like, call him immediately and just like, let him know what's going on. And then from there, it was Taylor Smith. I'm gonna just give her a shout out because she's the one who truly helped me. Gave her the number to the GM and was like, call him right now and tell him what's going on. From there, I you know packed up most of my stuff and headed to straight up to Tacoma. In there, I, I kind of earned my contract. And so like at that time, like when I got released, they had gone on a travel trip. So if this had again been me a year, two years ago, I probably would have been crying and distraught during this time, but I was training, I was running, I was working. I, you know, I, I finally built up the courage to call my parents because I told my brother, but I was just like, I told them, I was like, I know I'm capable of so much more. and this might look bleak to the outside, but I know that this wasn't the place where I was going to succeed. Like, I'm telling you to trust me. And like, I was like, can you tell my, I actually asked him to tell my parents. I was like, can you tell them that I was waived, but I have a plan and I'm not going to stop. I was like, I'm not going to stop. Cause I don't think this is where my journey ends. And he did, it was my older brother. And, and then I made my way to Tacoma. And so I think that's where things started to kind of, you know, work out for me a little bit. I got more opportunities. I got to show myself a little bit more. And, you know, from there I got treated here, which again was not upset about because look at, look where I am. And I'm so happy about, you know, the opportunities I've been given. And, you know, I think in a way I've been working towards this for, you know, this is what my four or five years I've been in the league has been working up to. So yeah, wow. it's just, there's <laughs> it's been a journey. <laughs> wow. What a, what a, like a lot to unpack right there. Because yeah. <laughs> you were working at it and it was a journey. Mm -hmm. And I want to kind of go back to something that you said, which was like, you didn't feel like you were given a chance at that team and that moment mm -hmm. when you know you were putting in the work. So why do you think that was? Did you can you look back now and see what it was? Because I I feel that like a lot of young girls or even women in your same position maybe at their teams right now might be feeling the same way. I think, you know, no matter what there are people are going to do what they want to do and I think in terms of coaches there are hard decisions that need to be made. They can't honestly, unfortunately, they can't give everyone an opportunity especially in soccer, only 11 people can play at a time. And then, you know, being a professional, you can only make at the time three subs, now five subs, even that's not even a lot, you know? So not everyone can really get an opportunity, no matter how good you are, you know? And sometimes you have too many good players. And so now you're going to have to leave really good people either off the roster or, you know, not on the field. So I think for me, it came to a point where I was like, I can only control certain things and I can only control, you know, how hard I work. That's all I can control, you know, nothing else, like not me not being on the field. And again, this was like a learning experience. Me not being on the field didn't mean I wasn't working hard. Like I can't control being on the field. I can't put myself on the field, unfortunately. And I think that's a realization that a lot of people have to make. You can't give yourself that promotion. You, know I mean? you can't do it like you can work towards getting a promotion but you can't give it to yourself and I thought you know I had to shift sort of that in my mind I was just like 
no, I'm not getting these opportunities. So maybe I need to go somewhere else where I'm going to be given that opportunity. It wasn't really an option in his head to put me on the field. I can't control what that is and how he thinks of me. And so I'm like, I need to go somewhere where the opportunity actually exists because ultimately it didn't exist there. And just realizing like, you know, I could have stopped and, you know what I mean, called that the end of my journey. But I guess I chose not to. And I've given this a lot of thought, this like this idea of like just stopping. And as long as I keep going and trying, the journey is not over. As long as I keep trying, the journey is over. The moment I stop, the journey is over. You know what I mean? I got cut and I could have been like, that's the end of my journey. It's not the end of my journey. You know what I mean? My journey, as long as I keep going, it's still, my journey is still there. So it, that is, that's my choice as well. Yeah. Love it. That's such good advice, you know, for anybody who's, yeah. regardless of like what level you're at or where you're at. I mean, it's a process and we're all like work in process. I always believe our journey doesn't end. You know, I think, yeah, we've got a lot to do accomplish in this world. And when one door closes, another one opens sounds super cliche, but it, but it is true. What you just described is a perfect Absolutely. example. And I love that, you know, people are telling you you're this, you're that, you're this. And you're like, wait a minute, what do I think I am? Like, I think that's one of the most exactly. powerful things about your story. And it's very inspiring because, you know, confidence, it can be hard. You get knocked down a lot <laughs> in sport and in life. And how you turn yourself is a big part, you know, of your success. So it's really cool. Okay, so fast forward and you've gone now through three teams. You're, you know, you're at Gotham City now. And you're also on the Nigerian national team. You get called to the Ni Nigerian national team. So tell me about that experience and what that means to you, because both of your parents are from Nigeria. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing. I think for a long time, like, there's no secret that I wanted. I had that dream of reaching the U.S. national team. But I think there became a point where maybe that isn't maybe that isn't where I belong. And I have the opportunity to play for Nigeria. And again, both my parents are, are Nigerian. So, so far it's been like playing international soccer, I think is my dream. You know, that is like the pinnacle. I think everyone, maybe, maybe not everyone, I don't want to put everyone in that box, but you know, I think for soccer, like you want to play international soccer. That is like the top level. That's the top level. And then when I got that opportunity, it, I was so like thankful for it. And it felt just like, just everything I was working for was just kind of falling into place. But I'm not going to lie. It does come with a little bit of stress as well. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, yeah, it's always a learning experience for me. So like, although I'm reaching like these goals and they're coming, like that just comes with just like more expectation and that can, you know, breed self-doubt. But just like looking back at, you know, everything I've been through, I think it's sort of prepared me for this moment. And so it feels really good to, you know, be here and have the opportunity to play and, you know, definitely dip culturally different, I think, from what I have, I'm used to even at club level, or I know, you know, how they do it in the US and definitely culturally different. But even that has been an amazing experience, because it feels like I've gotten so much co closer to how my parents were, you know, brought up and culturally what they experienced um, when they were younger. So yeah, it's been, you know, quite, quite crazy, but amazing at the same time. <laughs> yeah, it's very cool. What would you say to um, a young woman today who's like, considering going pro, like considering sort of the pro life, you know, because unfortunately, women are still not getting paid a great deal in the league. And mm -hmm. things are getting better, but it's still the salary is pretty low. You're 27. And you just got a sponsorship with Adidas, which is incredible but you didn't get it right out of college. So let's no. like talk about the opportunity and what you weighed because academics was really important to you all the way through high school, but also in college. You studied integrative biology in school and you're super passionate about these other areas. So did you ever think, well, maybe I should take the path of becoming a doctor and there's this true, you know, there's a true salary there. There's a true path. Mm -hmm. So the girls that are trying to think about what do I do here? What should they consider in making that decision? You know, I think I'm not going to naively say like money doesn't matter. Like uh, it, it does. It does because, you know, 
it matters. It definitely matters. And it, it matters. And be... it's okay to say it matters. <laughs> yeah, it does. Exactly. I think a lot of people, oh, not a lot of people, but like, they like to say like, oh, do what you're passionate about. Like, you know, money doesn't matter. But I'm like, it does. It do- especially if you knew how much we get paid in the league, like you'd understand why it matters just a little bit. For me, when I entered the league, I think the minimum was like $16,000. And a lot of women were on the minimum. It was very very bad that's your Um, annual salary annual salary and we didn't even get paid throughout the year we got paid like for only that you know portion that we were in season and that was only like six months so yeah it was it was very bad and it, it is getting better and I think you know what I mean as we continue to fight and have these conversations that kind of pushes forward so I always want to make sure that you know, no matter what, you continue to fight and have this conversation. We need to keep talking about this and make sure they know that this is still not okay. I'm going to continue to complain because that's the only way we get things. Like a lot of the women in the league have to have second jobs because obviously the annual salary is not enough to support unless you're on the national team. You know, you're not getting paid. You're not getting paid anything so it was a moment for me and I think this comes from like what my parents like my parents weren't sure if they wanted me to play professionally because they knew we didn't get paid and it just kind of fed their fears I understand the fear came from the unknown like we don't know how you will survive on this salary like you don't know how you're going to take care of yourself you know with making so little so their fears are real because it was very little money but for soccer i there's mm-hmm. only there's only a small amount of time in which i can decide to play so as long as i want to continue to play it i knew that it had to be now or it was it's not like i can just come back later like it was like once i stopped it was done so because i want to continue to play i said to myself like what am i basically willing to compromise in order to do what I want to do. And I can always go back to school. The thing is, I always have my mind. I always have my education. I can always go back to school if I want to. You know what I mean? Like medicine is not off the table for me. I think, you know, when I'm done playing, it's still something I want to go back into. But right now playing is something I can only do whilst I'm young. So, and that's what I chose to do. And I was like, and it makes me happy. So that's kind of what I weighed. And yeah. And I, and again, I believe that I am I have the ability in this game. So that is why I I chose this and sort of foregoed any sort of financial (laughs) financial stability I probably would have had with a career that, you know, (laughs) offered. Yeah, you did. Yeah, you definitely did. And I mean, it's not like it's gotten that much better. Mm -hmm. I mean, right, the the minimum salary for the 2021 season is Mm $22,000. The maximum is only $52,000. Yeah. So I think, you know, it's an increase and it's gotten better, but you compare that to the men in the, in the MLS. So U.S. soccer, men's soccer, which isn't the best in the world. Mm-hmm. And they're getting, you know, almost close to 400000 for their average player salary. Yeah. So, I mean, there's just a lot of work to be done. So is, was this part of why you guys created the Black Women's Players Collective or was the focus mostly on like, how do we get more black girls in the sport more black women in leadership roles like was this the pay part of it walk me back I guess a little bit on like why you joined the board and why it was so important for you guys to come together and use your voice to drive change yeah I think for the most part it is supposed to be empowering and you know giving exposure to and of women of color in in sport in soccer so our main initiative is just to you know provide role models for young black girls. But on top of that, going back to, you know, the fact that we don't get paid, a lot of the things we want to do, so like when we have clinics, we want to make sure that, you know, the athletes that we have working these clinics are getting paid to, to, for their time. I think a lot of the times this league asks a lot of their athletes without providing any, any compensation. Yeah, several times. And I'm like, that's not okay. Like our time is valuable. Our image is valuable. Like you see on using the U.S. women's national team as a template, you see how valuable their image really is. And, you know, I think in some degree, the NWSL is lacking in that. But we recognize that and we want to make sure that anyone who does any work for us is getting compensated accordingly for doing that work. Like, yes, what we're doing is important. You know what I mean? And I believe in all our work, but at the same time, like, it's not it's not wrong to ask for compensation for the time you are spending because it is hard work. 
It is hard work having absolutely friends, you know. It's hard work being a mentor. It's hard work, you know, going out to a field and trying to inspire like thousands, you know, in, in social media, you know what I mean? Who knows, hundreds of thousands of girls. So yeah, I you know, part of it was to make sure that, you know, there was some sort of financially support to supplement the little we make in the league. That's right. That's why when we were we were working on our partnership with Boys in Sport and Black Women's Players Collective, we brought you guys on to be mentors to girls and to get paid mm -hmm. while you're doing it. <laughs> right? Totally. And we've paid all of our mentors from day one at Viz because we need to provide more income for women in the sports industry, period. Whether you're a player or you want to be an executive, like there's still a gap on the executive side yes. for women and what they get paid. And there's a gap on the sponsorship side. Mm -hmm. And then there's a gap at the player level in between men and women. So we've got a lot of work to do, but you know, it's groups like yours, women like you, that will help drive that change. And that's why we're so excited to have you also part of our advocacy team. Let's talk a little bit about like, where does the passion for advocacy come from for you? You know, did you ever feel like your voice was never or wasn't heard in certain situations when you were growing up through a predominantly white sport? Or did you find that you always had that voice and you were like one to be loud and extrovert and sort of like upfront about what you wanted? Like, tell us a little bit about like, I guess you and advocacy and like, mm -hmm. what does it mean to you? I, I would say for me, I definitely was not the loud one in the group. I am not an extrovert by any means, but it doesn't mean that I think <laughs> some people, if you say you're introverted, that means you're shy. It's not necessarily that I'm shy. I think, you know, often I don't necessarily like feel the need to be, I don't feel the need to be the loudest person in the room. I really don't, you know, but I do think that now it's important. I think there was a there's a point where I'm just like, I need to I have this platform and I need to be using this platform to to speak for those who do not have the ability to to have the reach that I have the ability to have. So that's kind of where my fight like I have all these thoughts and I have all these feelings, but I was always the one to be like, Yeah, well that's within me. Like I don't feel the need to share that with anybody. Like it's not important to me to make sure everyone knows what I think about a situation. But there comes a point where, yeah, I think, you know, people do need to know what you think to a degree, especially if you have and can have a positive impact on people's lives. So that's kind of why I, what advocacy means to me, it's just like, you know, not everyone has, you know, the, like I'm a professional athlete and, you know, for some pre reason people want to listen to me. So... <laughs> You know, as long as I have the ability to reach these people, I prefer it be someone like, weirdly, I prefer it be someone like me where I don't have any malice or hate in my heart to spread as opposed to, you know, giving the mic to somebody who that's all that they want to to spread. So, yeah, I think, you know, for me, that's why I decided to become an advocate. I love it. So how do you how do we create a more inclusive and diverse um, environment in the soccer world? Like, what do you think are some of the key things that need to change in order to see more leaders, more young girls in sport? What are the areas that you think that still need a lot of work? I would say right now would probably be just coaching. For me, I think right now, my I, this is the first time in my career that I have had a female or a woman head coach. First time in my career. All through my youth career, club, college, no. Just man, men, 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 men. White men too, you know? Those have been my teachers. And I think because of that, I think there's a strange, I've talked about this a little bit before, but there's a strange power dynamic there is with, I think, women and men. And I think, especially in sport, obviously you have your head coach. And there becomes a point where obviously when you get to like professional, you have a lot of experience underneath your belt. But you feel like because throughout your playing career, you've always had to just follow the rules and follow what he says, then, you know, you kind of get stuck in that sort of space, even though you're like, you know, I think at, at one point you ha I had my head coach who was, 
younger than some of the players on the team. So I'm like, they have a load of experience. And I'm not saying that they should butt heads with the coach, but they have valuable knowledge that could be utilized. But I often find that I think through just socialization in general and like this sort of hierarchy and this, you know, you get a lot of pushback, I think, you know, as a woman, when you try to sometimes suggest things, you get a lot of pushback and you're seeing like, it's not the same conversation of, well, he's just passionate. You get like, she's difficult to work with. Aggressive. You know what I mean? She's aggressive. Or aggressive. Yes, definitely. And so... Yeah. Having a head coach who's a woman has been different because I feel like now you feel I just just more comfortable with, you know, being in that space of being able to suggest things and talk, talk through things and talk about, you know, dynamics and not getting that pushback of you're trying to step on my toes type of thing that I I tend to feel like I I got from their male counterparts. Isn't it interesting, like power, power and safety, right? Definitely. It's like once you start pushing that power dynamic, like as a woman with or against a man, there's immediately this tension. And that power dynamic is just so important to kind of step back and and see, right? Like understanding that context and saying, oh, wow, interesting. That was the response I got from from saying it to this person. Mm Mm-hmm said the same thing to that person, different response. And I think that understanding the context of which you're in, yes, whether you're talking about the, the team you're on, the coaching staff, the general managers that are involved or in the workplace is one of the biggest lessons I feel like I've taken away from, you know, 15 years of the sports industry. And it's dangerous because just like what you talked about before, Efi, is – it might just be the situation that you're in that's not right versus yeah. like, wait a minute, all my ideas are bad or I don't think I belong here. And that's like the context part of it, right? Mm-hmm. Being able to step back and say, oh, okay, there's a dynamic going on here. <laughs> so what does that mean? You know, and it's it's really hard to do that when you're a lot younger and yeah, you're in cool. your younger and especially younger in pro life or mm-hmm. just coming onto a team. So What advice do you have for girls that are like trying to find their voice and they show up in a space where they don't really quite feel confident to use their voice or they maybe tried once and they sort of got this pushback? Yeah. Oh, man, that is tough because I think I struggled with that finding where and when and especially when you are new, like where is the space to do that? Honestly, I think you look to if we're talking about sports for me, I look to my captain, you know, if I have a problem, I look to my captain, like, hey, can you sort of, you know, talk about this or talk to the coach about this? Or like, I've I've noticed this, like, just kind of trying to get people on your side. And I feel like there's much more room for conversation there with your teammate or your age mate or, you know, someone who is in the same boat as you, as opposed to just going straight to the head, especially when you're, when you're new. It's very hard. It's very hard. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Sometimes like that direct path isn't always like yeah. the best path, right? Mm-hmm. That's That can be hard sometimes, I think, for people, even myself, who are like, like to move fast and like who are competitive and want to get stuff done. And, and, you know, I think that's a really, it's a really smart thing. It, it's not always linear mm-hmm. how things happen, right? Yeah. I think those that are in power are more open to like the direct path because they understand like that's the fastest way to get some things done. There are others who feel threatened by that. So, (laughs) and it is those who you have to go around (laughs) to get things done, unfortunately. Yep. Wow. It's such good lessons. Okay. Well, when you take a step back, Efi, and you look at your journey and, you know, it's incredible what you have accomplished and the things that you're continuing to do on the field, off the field. What advice do you have for girls about sticking with their journey? If they if they ever feel like it's too rough, <laughs> it's not going the way they wanted to or they're, you know, they're having a tough time. Like what is your single piece of advice that you would tell younger girls? I think, you know, like I did in high school, you take a break. <laughs> you take a break and you regroup. I think that is the best. You take a breath. I think if there's anything that I I learned is that it is okay to reassess. It is okay 
to just be like, this isn't something I want to do right now. Like, this is something that I can just step away from at any point in time. And then ask yourself the questions, is this something I want to do? You know what I mean? Like, and honestly, if it's not, I think that's okay. But I think it's always important to do what you think is best for you and have confidence in your decision, you know, and you can always come back, especially like a lot of these, I feel like with the amount of pressure that there is right now in sport, you forget that you're young. I'm like, you're so young. You have time. I would just say you have time. Like there's nothing determined right now. There are people at the age of 27 who don't even know me, who don't even know who they are anymore right now. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not saying I don't know who I am, but like people go through different stages and as you get older, you're continually to grow and you change, you will change your mind when you're older and you will change, you will probably change your career and you are 15 and you're not sure if you want to do this anymore. Take a break. You know what I mean? Take that time for yourself, have fun with your friends. And then if you decide you want to do it, let's start to work. You know what I mean? Let's get back to work. Love it. Yeah. Such good advice. Well, okay, what do you say to a young black girl who feels like they don't belong in the sport of soccer? <sighs> That's a hard one. I've been there. It's, it's difficult, I think. Don't let anyone stop you from achieving what you want to achieve. I'm not going to lie and say it's not hard because it is. But I think if you look to those who support you, just you really have to find your your crew. I think it can be very bleak when you're in a space where no one else looks like you. But fortunately, now I think hopefully with the BWPC, we are providing role models that you can look to and be like, this is somewhere I belong. Like, this is someone I can look up to. Like, they did it. I know I can achieve this. Well, I think anybody can can see that you have such passion, you know, for what you're for what you're doing. And like, the what you guys are working towards at the Black Women's Players Collective is going to have a huge impact. And I love that you guys are coming together, doing the things you're doing. I love that you're part of Voice and Sport. And, you know, young girls can come and have a whole conversation with you about <laughs> about seeing themselves in sport. And I think that's so amazing to like what we've what we've built together over there. I'd love to, to sort of wrap up the conversation. But mm -hmm. what is one thing if you had to choose one? What is one thing you'd like to see changed for the future of women's sports? And that's probably like <laughs> one thing that's difficult because I feel like there's so many things. But for me, I need women to be paid more. I think we right now, particularly in the NWSL, continue to treat this league like a charity as opposed to something that can grow and actually have profit. And I think that needs to change immediately. Like women are putting their hearts and souls into this game and we deserve to be paid for such. We're not a charity. So like stop treating women's sports as charity. Stop treating women's soccer as charity. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You have to invest, right? Yes. You have to invest in something to see it grow. And if you want to return on that investment, you have to put money in. Yes. So I think it's so important. I hope that we continue to see amazing companies step up to do that. And thank you for spending so much time today, just sharing your story and, and being so vulnerable about your experience, because I think what you shared today with your own inner dialogue is one in which many of us go through at a certain point in our lives. So Ify, it was so great to have you. Yes, it was great to speak with you. Amazing. <laughs> This episode of the Voice and Sport podcast was produced by Viz creator Rena Schwartz, a skier at Dartmouth College. Thank you, Ify, for joining us today. You are doing such important work as a role model for young girls and as a board member at the BWPC. And thank you for sharing your wisdom with all of our community members today. Ify reminds us of the power that comes from focusing on what you believe in about yourself and not about what other people have told you about yourself. Today, she encouraged us to stop worrying about what is out of our control and instead attend to what we can do to make ourselves a better person and athlete. You can gain access to incredible mentors like Ify and other Black Women Player Collective players on voiceandsport.com when you sign up as a biz athlete. 
You can also check out our partnership with the BWPC at bwplayercollective.org. Please subscribe to the Voice and Sport podcast and give us a rating. You can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok at Voice and Sport. And if you're interested in joining our community at voiceandsport.com, you will have access to exclusive content, mentorship from pro and collegiate athletes, access to the top viz experts in sports psychology and nutrition, and of course, advocacy tools to drive change. Check out voiceandsport.com to join us for free. We hope you've enjoyed this episode, and for similar content, please check out episode number 47 when I speak with professional soccer player and BWPC board member Jasmine Spencer. See you next week on the Voice and Sport podcast.